an excellent morning to everyone. I'm Shamir, member of the Singapore Business Federation's Digitalization Committee. And yes, I'm pleased to be your moderator today for our first panel this morning. So as context, I'm a founder of a deep tech company myself. So I feel passionately for artificial intelligence in the supply chain space in particular. So yeah, Graham has kindly introduced a panel and this morning, we'll be hearing the experiences from multiple dimensions of a digitalization journey, from large companies who have successfully undertaken this, the highs and the lows, right? From the perspectives of intellectual property, to finally the startup perspective in identifying and leveraging new opportunities in the economy. So how we're gonna do this is we'll have each panelist share a short presentation for about 10 minutes each, and after which we'll do a live discussion for about 20 minutes. So keep those questions coming. So as we listen to each panelist, I would like us to keep the key message in mind, which is two words, digitalize now. <laughs> so if there's anything you take away uh, from this next one hour, it's really these two words. Yeah, so uh, I hope I did a Netflix worthy introduction, Graham. Uh, it was fantastic. <laughs> it starts from digitalize now. So let's learn about, right. Jameer, please take it away. All right, cool. So uh, without further ado, I would like to invite uh, Mr. Nicholas Lee. He's the Chief Executive Officer of EasyLink, and he's also a member of the SG Tech Committee. Right, so uh, for the next 10 minutes, please, uh, Nicholas, uh, go ahead and share us the perspectives from, from both views. Yeah. All right. All right. <clears throat> All right, thank you, Shamir, and a uh, very good morning uh, to everyone. Uh, today, I'm actually wearing the uh, edgy tech hat, so I'll go straight into it. Next slide, please. All right, so who is SG Tech? So SG Tech is an association representing uh, about close to 1,000 uh, IT organizations in Singapore. Uh, we create platforms for networking domestically and internationally to build connections, create opportunities. We also work closely with government institutions to provide feedback on policies and initiatives and provide assistance to reach out to our industry partners to execute those uh, policies and initiatives. Next slide, thank you. So SG Tech uh, has various chapters uh, focusing on various strategic issues, uh, issues ranging from uh, things like smart nation, cybersecurity, cloud, and of course, digital transformation, which is a very key topic today. Next, please. So from SG Tech, there are actually two perspectives on going digital, right? The first being digital transformation and the other being digitalization. Now, both may seem similar, but we view it as actually very, both are very different in nature. And I'll explain a bit more in the following slides. Next, please. So let's talk about digitalization. Digitalization is where a company leverages off technology and tools to increase productivity or efficiency by doing more with less or using these tools to gain access to new channels and services that can meet their business growth objectives. So for example, a company may choose to invest into a software robot, uh, some we, we call it RPA, Robotic Process Automation. And when this robot takes over a mundane task of an operations officer who currently does uh, data entry work process that requires some basic calculations. Now this then frees up the person to be upskilled and focus on more value-adding tasks for the company, which could be maybe to program more such robots. Now to grow the business, a retailer can also start to integrate with e-commerce platforms like Lazada, Q10, to access a wider customer base both domestically and internationally. Whatever initiatives that are taken, there must be clear, measurable objectives. Digitalization must lead to business growth and businesses must be very clear that when you undertake or adopt such tools, there are very clear, measurable objectives so that you can gauge the success and whether the tools are effective and working for you. Next, please. So these are some examples and perhaps the facilitator can just click through all the examples at the end of the slide. Yeah, uh, so these are some uh, examples of digital tools that our SG Tech members provide today to help in the digitalization process. So these are grouped, uh, arranged into various uh, business objectives. And some of it are very, very uh, familiar, like the platform you are using today, Zoom, 
I think a lot of people use Microsoft Teams, Google Meets as well. Uh, to what we talk about uh, e-invoicing, e writing on the Pebble uh, platform, to familiar things like CRM systems uh, via Salesforce. Right? So these are examples of tools that companies can use to actually uh, accelerate their whole uh, business transformation to be more efficient and to be more productive. Next, please. So let me talk about digital transformation now. And I think this is where uh, it is the most complex part of it. So digital transformation is a longer and more complex path. It starts with looking at a company's business model and charting a path on how it can be transformed to stay relevant and even grow in the new digital landscape. It involves looking at culture, structure, processes, and how these need to evolve to support the new business model defined. In this uncertain world, building more resilience into our businesses is important. Hence, as part of the digital transformation journey, there are good practices that can be adopted to maintain agility in our business and processes so we can adapt and more importantly, pivot quickly to meet the changes. Now remember that transformation is continuous and it applies to all parts of a company and not just the sales and operation functions. It can even cover contracts, procurement, customer service, finance, and even HR. Transformation does not necessarily have to do with applying technology. It means changing traditional ways of working, renewing policies and practices in an agile and dynamic way to better, your, to better support your business in an increasingly uncertain world. And through the process, I'm sure you will look to acquiring the right digital tools to make the change easier. And lastly, we must never forget that at the center of such change is our people. So don't forget that our workforce has to be equipped with the right skills and the right mindset to support this ongoing transformation effort. Next, please. So in a nutshell, uh, of course, it's easier said than done. There are so many factors to consider and there will be resistance from your people as it is a change from the norm. Um, just looking back at uh, my company, EasyLink, uh, we struggled, we really struggled in the first year, almost gave up, uh, but somehow we persevered and that was about four years ago and until today, we are still transforming. So it is always an ongoing journey. Next slide, please. So SG Tech can partner and take this journey together with you. Uh, we provide webinars, workshops, we assist companies on how they can leverage off various talent programs and government grants. And most recently, we worked with the government to launch a star fund, which is to aid SMEs in their digitalization or transformation journey through the adoption of tools or training. More importantly, given the convergence of technology to all aspects of business, we also welcome non-tech companies to join SG Tech. Next, please. So this is uh, some highlights on the star fund that was uh, recently announced. So STAR stands for Stronger Together Aiding Recovery. And uh, this fund goes out to help our members uh, help their clients, uh, essentially SMEs, to embark or on board onto uh, digitalization. Right? So we are starting to accept uh, applications from 1st October. So details are there. You can find more details on the SG web, uh, Tech website as well. We are very grateful uh, for this fund. It could never happen without the support of Facebook, one of our key uh, SG Tech members, and of course, uh, Enterprise Singapore. Next. And the last one, of course, we welcome everybody to join SG Tech. Uh, on behalf of the Secretary, they are happy to provide some uh, discounts. So please uh, go to the website and if you have time, uh, we welcome you to sign up. Uh, that's all for me. Uh, next slide. Yeah, that's all for me. So thank you very much uh, <laughs> for the attention. Back to you, Shamir. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nicholas. So well within time, so we are well on track. Um, so you heard briefly, uh, I mean, uh, the perspective, um, you know, from as SG Tech looking at industry, and I think Nicholas mentioned briefly as well the easily experience. You know, wasn't always smooth. So on that note, actually, um, I think this will be a recurring theme you hear. So um, thank you again, Nicholas, for sharing. Um, next, I would like to invite uh, Mr. Manjot Singh, who is the Chief Executive Officer of M1. And he'll be sharing the M1 experience, right? These ups and downs. 
And I think as business owners ourselves, having that, that perspective and ex from the actual first-hand experience uh, is insightful, so we don't make the same mistakes, right? Uh, so uh, without further ado, if I can invite Mr. Manjot, please. Thank you very much, and I hope uh, everybody can hear me. Um, yeah, so uh, somebody spoke about how uh, digital transformation is is a pain, a necessary pain that I think organizations have to go through to create pleasure later. Um, and uh, we are at M1 in the throes of the transformation journey. Uh, we started about one and a half years back. Um, and um, I'll be careful in using the word uh, digital transformation and not digitalization because now I've learned the difference between the two. So thank you, Nicholas, for that. Um, but I think uh, more importantly, um, I'll take um, everyone through, through um, what our journey has been and what we really think uh, digital transformation should do. Uh, so first slide, please. Thank you. So, um, you know, everybody's been talking about uh, digitalization and digital transformation. But guess what? What sits in the middle of all this? Um, what sits in the middle of all this is a telecom company. Um, and um, quite interestingly, uh, the telecom companies have got unfortunately repositioned as utility companies. Uh, and that's where I think uh, is, is, is the challenge and the opportunity for a telecom company uh, to transform itself. Um, and we are in, in that journey uh, as of now to make sure that we don't get repositioned uh, as, a, as, a, as a utility company, but every, um, partner ecosystem around telecom companies are creating value, uh, are transforming themselves. Uh, I think it is high time uh, that a telecom company must transform itself uh, to create that value uh, for its shareholders uh, and its partners. Uh, next slide, please. So these are the four, we call it the real uh, challenges, uh, because this is what drives uh, transformation and this is what we have uh, considered in M1 as we go along in our transformation journey. Um, firstly, clearly we all know uh, whether it is uh, driven proactively uh, or uh, by destiny uh, through uh, pandemics like uh, COVID, uh, there, is, um, there is a digitalization that's happening and a process of, of consumer behavioral change uh, that is happening. Uh, and therefore, uh, it, is, it is very important for telecom companies to respond uh, to this change dynamically because clearly product life cycles are getting shorter, uh, people are getting more, uh, more impatient, I would say, uh, and more demanding of services as we go along. So uh, the response has to be uh, adequate. The second is, of course, the customers like we all have started doing ourselves. Uh, we are becoming more self-reliant uh, and self-service is becoming more and more order of the day. Um, whether it is in terms of buying or servicing our own utilities and everything else that we do in our lives. Um, and that stands for consumers as individuals. It also stands for SMEs as, as, uh, as uh, transformation happens. So I think the, the challenge is how do we empower our uh, subscribers and consumers to be able to self-serve uh, as much as possible. Um, someone spoke about attracting talent. I think that is going to be an extremely important piece, um, both with the help of government and IMDA uh, and ourselves to be able to attract talent. I think that's going to be a very key factor uh, because we have faced that problem in M1 where uh, while we are going through this digital transformation journey, um, we are not necessarily the first uh, port of call for fresh new digital talent. Uh, and therefore that stands, to, um, that stands to a disadvantage for us because we are not able to attract the best talent. So I think um, as we transform and as we are known as a more digital organization, I think we will be able to attract fresher talent. Uh, however, that does not take away from the fact that we have to necessarily reskill and upskill our, uh, uh, our own employees who have been in the organization for many, many years. Uh, and lastly, I think as we create an ecosystem of partnerships, uh, I think it is very, very important for an organization like ours, which is a telco, that we, we go for the share of wallet of a customer and not necessarily just the mobile uh, market share that we, that we keep addressing. I think the challenge is going to be that all, all of us as subscribers uh, use multiple services and we use multiple 
partners uh, and and uh, and uh, commercial um, establishments uh, and then how does how does the telco take a uh, uh, part in that and and get a larger share of the wallet of customers and that i think is going to be driven through creating um, partnerships uh, quicker and faster and more relevant partnerships uh, as we go along so these are the four driving principles of our of our transformation as we have uh, chosen um, next slide please so like i said of course um, the the opportunities have to be real and in our in our uh, experience i think uh, it it was very very important for us uh, as an organization to be able to define our end game first you know because transformation is such a large such a long journey uh, that there is there is a very strong chance of the organization missing the woods for the trees uh, because it it is like nicholas said it is something that once you get into it the commitment uh, of the organization the commitment of the teams um, the culture everything needs to start working towards creating that transformational journey but having said that the moment you get deeper and deeper into it um, you you stand a chance of getting lost in it and, and therefore losing the end sight so for us it was important to define the end goal first of where we want to reach what objectives uh, driven by the business transformation that we that we uh, that we want to achieve and from there we work backwards in terms of what are the elements of transformation we need to work on uh, within the organization and how do we drive it uh, then the question is how how do we drive it and and what what really makes this how possible um, next slide please so clearly uh, so when your when your destination is defined and your destination is known that this is where we want to reach in terms of the business objectives in terms of the journeys that we need to create for customers uh, and 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 the and both the digitalization elements that we need to bring into our people processes and technology how do we get there and there are next slide please and there are two ways to do this really in our mind um one is called be digital and the other is called do digital uh, and i think it is extremely important um, for every uh, company Uh, to define this um, because both have their own uh, positives and negatives both have their advantages and disadvantages um one is of course quicker faster uh, you get quick benefits uh, and from a technology standpoint you need little customization of your old technology or the legacy technology that you have so that's pretty much uh, i would i would i would err on the side of uh, of uh, Uh, of exaggeration and call it cosmetic changes um because i think uh, a lot of organizations in the name of digital transformation and in the name of digitalizations tend to be uh, quicker faster uh, and therefore think that that is what transformation is but to our mind be digital is more important uh, where you take the transformation deep down into the organization uh, wide across the organization including in our case as we are doing completely revamping and rebuilding our technology platform so we have uh, you know when we started our transformation journey um, only 12% of our of our um, uh, digital stack as i would call it the old one uh, was in the cloud um, now 93% of our new digital platform is cloud native what that does is to be able to give you the agility and the advantage of time and capacity and scalability uh, to the business um, the other thing of of uh, of uh, be digital is to be able to train your people to be able to create a culture and and embed a new way of working uh, because in a digital organization uh, the, uh, the way people interact the way you seek results is very very different than the old legacy uh, your organizations do and i think that is an extremely important piece because nothing moves without moving people and and that is going to be very important for uh, for this journey of being digital yes it takes longer it requires patience uh, it requires support of your shareholder and it requires the commitment from top uh, because you know if you don't have the patience and if you don't have the gumption to go through it then the best is to do digital and not be digital but in m1 we have decided to be digital and we have we have charted our course like i said we uh, we have defined our destination and we are well on the path to uh, get there next slide please um like i said i think 
of uh, being digital, the advantage is speed to market because that is going to be extremely critical as we go along. Uh, we know uh, that competition is only increasing. We know that multiple services are being launched by multiple businesses. Uh, very interestingly, businesses are not remaining siloed anymore. Uh, multiple businesses are creating a mesh uh, and not a mess. Uh, and uh, you know, if you look at if you look at digital organizations like Grab, for example, or Lazada, for example, or us in the future, um, we will provide all services to subscribers that uh, that are not necessarily uh, the ones that we were born with. Uh, so I think that is going to be critical. The second, like I said, is self-service. More and more uh, consumers are going to be defining their own journeys and their own ways of uh, interacting with brands and, and products. And I think uh, self-service is going to be extremely critical. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm quite surprised that even today, you know, um, telecom operators have um, multiple stores where people physically go and buy uh, stuff. I think the challenge is how do you make sure that you keep a balance between uh, uh, the physical world and the digital world and some people like to call it digital. Uh, but I think uh, that, is, that is going to be increasingly challenging for all companies uh, in times to come, including uh, services companies. Uh, and the last bit is of course scalability. Uh, to me, I think uh, as you grow, the pangs of growth will definitely <clears throat> excuse me, hit your hit your ability to address uh, multiple products, multiple lines of businesses, multiple types of services that you launch. Uh, and therefore, uh, scalability is extremely important. And to us, uh, being 100% cloud native uh, in our digital platform uh, and creating ways of working uh, will help us scale uh, quickly, not just in Singapore, but have the opportunity of addressing markets outside of Singapore as well. Next, please. So last slide, I think it's a process of evolution. It's a process of evolution for people uh, because skills need to be developed. Uh, you have to infuse fresh talent uh, to make sure that people understand uh, what, uh, what the new technologies are. Uh, and it is an evolution of uh, technology, like I said, uh, moving from legacy stacks and customized stacks to be more cloud native so that you get scale, you get agility. Uh, and it's of course, uh, very importantly, an evolution of processes within the organization. So um, while you might do a lot of things at the front end for the consumers and you might get your digital platform ready, uh, the processes that connect the two are extremely important to be digitalized as well, whether it's in form of RPA or otherwise. Uh, there are many tools available which we are now deploying in our organization to making sure that while customers are um, able to enjoy the best app from M1, um, delivered by the best technology platform that we are developing, but people are still using memos to get approvals. And that does not kind of uh, ring well. So uh, we are, we are uh, transforming our processes as well within the organization to make sure um, that we do this transformation as Nicholas rightly pointed out, end to end and not just one part of the business. Um, and that's my last slide and thank you very much. Thank you so much. Manjur, that was really insightful. Uh, you'd be happy to know that the journey has been reaping dividends. I mean, I've been an M1 customer for decades now and I can experience the benefits of, you know, uh, interacting through the app now and everything. So kudos to, to the team there. Yeah, so um, I can see the questions coming. So please do keep them coming and I will queue the, 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 you know, the, the right panelists at that point. Um, our next speaker, uh, if I can invite uh, Dr. Ming Tan to maybe start uh, preparing the slides. So, um, Dr. Ming Tan is a managing director of the IP Office of Singapore International. So, she'll be sharing um, several examples and as well as from the intellectual property uh, point of view. So, uh, without further ado, please, Dr. Ming. Hi, thank you very much, Shamir, for your kind introduction. Um, I think, as my fellow panelists, Kev Nicholas and Manjad, have already covered, that like automation in the turn of the 20th century, digitalization is affecting every industry and it really is changing the way the game is played. So before Kevin shares his experience with Trames, um, I thought I'd maybe add uh, a few thoughts from a slightly different angle. That is how digitalization impacts the way we can think about a company's most valuable assets. And that would be from our perspective, its portfolio of intellectual property, 
and intangible assets. So let me give a quick introduction to IPOS International. So IPOS International is part of the Intellectual Property Office of Singapore. That's the IPOS part. And our vision is to support uh, enterprises to use intellectual property and intangible assets to grow. And today I'll just use IP for intellectual property and IA for intangible assets. And my team works with enterprises to help them understand and manage their IP and IA. And we also have a couple of key capabilities such as patent search, examination and analysis to support innovation in Singapore as a whole, as well as to provide training programs for companies and individuals to develop IP skills. A lot has already been say, said about upskilling and training and mindset shift. So um, we also provide training on that, on that front. But um, I was really tickled when there was this conversation about digital transformation versus digitalization. Next slide, please. So if you forgive me for being pedantic, Shamir, uh, let me bring in one more into the mix which is that digitalization itself is really about two things, which is digitization and then digitalization. And let me very quickly share with the team, with, with everybody here, on why that makes a difference from an intellectual property perspective. Because at its most basic, basic, basic level, digitization is about just turning any information into bits and bytes, right? And we're releasing it from the material and physical constraints of um, file or as Manjit was talking about having to have a memo for approval and when you release it from these physical and material constraints then your information can be copied it can be shared it can be massaged more easily and so we need to from an intellectual property and intangible assets perspective business owners have to think well maybe once you had a trade secret that you could lock in a safe but now you need to encrypt it or you need to create rights management around it. Maybe you had some, a song or a book or a, or a, a technical manual that uh, needed to be copied onto a tape or photocopied or into something for circulation. And now it can just be widely shared with very little version control. So now maybe you need something like digital watermarking. So the digitization itself has a couple of interesting intellectual property and intangible asset uh, steps in terms of helping companies do that properly. And then digitalization, the next step, as I think both Nicholas and Manjot have said, it's about then changing the entire organization. You change your business processes, you change the way you transact, you change business models, you change customer behavior, all of that. And it really does mean different things for different companies. And I love the be digital versus do digital um, dichotomy manja. It's so simple, but so easy to grasp. Um, so some companies will choose to do just the same thing, but in a different way and get efficiency, but not really largely changing the way they do business. I mean, for example, because of COVID-19, all of us have been on Zoom incessantly, I think. But the question is whether having remote meetings actually save time, that's the efficiency part, or did change the way we make decisions or even change the decisions at all. That would be in a way something um, that would be the outcome of digitalization. So let me give an example from a very, very different age because digitalization is really not new. In 1952, the Universal Automatic Computer or UNIVAC was used to predict the Eisenhower presidential victory over the pollster's favorite, Adlai Stevenson, based on sampling data. So it gave a result that was different to what everybody thought. And if we skip forward to a more recent past, the IPOS patent review landscape, next, next, next slide please, showed that smart digital technologies has been on the rise since the beginning of the last decade. So we look at this slide here, the purple is Singapore and um, the, the orange is worldwide. We can look at these growths of these technologies. And when we talk about smart, we're talking about the use of data and making sense of that data and then having some predictive element. So it's not just about gaining efficiencies or doing the same things faster, it's about doing things differently. Um, and although some of these technologies sound really techy, like IT methods for management or digital communication, actually, you'll see that the application and impact are felt across the entire economy. 
So if I drill down into IP methods of management, these are some of the top areas for patent filings. You begin to sound pretty familiar, right? Path, how you pay, e-commerce, how you can um, administrate and manage your information a lot more quickly. Next slide, please. And the computer technology, um, cybersecurity, data processing, program controls, these might be areas that all the companies here today might be already thinking about in your own businesses, even if you're not in the ICT sector. So for example, in the last row of the table, arrangements for program control, this is basically how a CPU executes instructions. Um, and these are generic things found in every computer and every electronic device. So I guess, what does this mean for Singapore, right? Um, for homegrown platform companies, we want to always track the strategies and patterns of big and existing players so that you don't infringe. When you develop your own technology, you're not infringing on other people's technology. But even if the technologies are owned by somebody else, I think every company, big or small, their strength is in the data. Because remember we talked about how the value is really created by digitalization when the technology is smart. And you need the data to make technology smart. And from an intellectual uh, property and intangible asset management perspective, that means perhaps businesses thinking a little bit differently about what it's most valuable assets are and data should definitely be in that bucket for any company. So I just wanted to share an example of a homegrown company, which is Cystic. And um, I, 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 of you, I, mean, I, I certainly grew up with Cystic. It's a ticketing company, Singapore homegrown, um, and it's been selling tickets to our favorite events since 2011. And once its biggest unique selling point was its real estate. I don't know about how many young people we have here, but it used to be that Cystic had outlets in all the shopping malls. So you could go and pick up your ticket. So that was as big as USP, its real estate and its footprint, its physical footprint. And then ticketing became digitized very quickly. So that's the do digital that Manjot mentioned. But the next journey of digitalization and digital transformation has been much longer. The Cystic management looked and said, oh my gosh, I've sold 20 million tickets since 2011. So what does that mean? What's the data that I have? I've got loads of information on payment methods, um, transaction time, sales channels, delivery methods. I've got loads of information about product. For example, what price classes sell well, um, when I should start selling before uh, people start to pick up, uh, what the venue is, which promoters do better than others. They've got loads of information on admission time because you scan your barcode, right? So I know, okay, this kind of event, people always come early or this kind of event, people always come right at the end and there's a big rush. So they can help the venue presenters staff up correctly. They've got information on all the um, patrons as well, uh, your name, your email and address. And this is perhaps, perhaps what we're most familiar with and that perhaps we're also most concerned with with regards to personal data. And they also have venues, the seat maps, the addresses, past shows, how configurable the venues are. So what can they do with this data? So they then went back and they say, well, what's our purpose? They have to serve the customer first, which is you and me who are looking to go and see a new show or a sporting event, and they can deliver new value by recommending new experiences based on customer purchase history and look alike modeling, right? And it's possible to create a specialized recommender for the arts and ent entertainment sector. For the clients who are the companies who are putting up the events, Cystic can use all of this past sales data to help clients forecast their sales with a higher degree of certainty and assurance. So that's super value added, right? Because what a uh, show promoter would not want to reduce its risk when it's putting out a big bet. And then Cystic itself, it could detect potential errors during event configuration, reducing the mistakes that maybe later on, um, you will have to go and do it manually. And you know, is this a dance program? Did we tag it correctly? Catch any mistakes at the first, at the first uh, get go, rather than having to fix it later. And all of this paid off when COVID-19 hit. 
because Cystic, in addition to this data and these technologies, they knew it was a known brand amongst customers who were all bored and stuck at home. It was a trusted partner to clients who were facing real difficulties in their business. And by going upstream, not just being a channel for sales, but helping being a business partner to them, helping them with their sales forecasting, they were really a trusted partner. And so the team used its know-how and arts and entertainment to launch Cystic Live, which is a live streaming portal for arts and entertainment in six weeks when Circuit Breaker hit. And so that's the B digital part, if I may, Manjo, if I can steal your phrase, Manjo. Next slide, please. Data can also be collateralized. Like any asset, you can value it. And um, in the recent uh, COVID pandemic, we know that all the airlines had, have been in trouble, right? And both United Airlines and American Airlines have secured multi-billion dollar loans by collateralizing their uh, customer loyalty programs. And so these are really pre-digital businesses, right? Airlines, but they were compelled to appraise and leverage their data in new ways, and they found new value as well. So to give an example, United's customer data was valued at $20 billion, even though the entire company's market capitalization at that point was only $9 billion. Next slide, please. So when digitalization can either change a business incrementally and bring new value to customers and clients, but it can unlock opportunities or even provide a lifeline for the company, um, depending on your particular industry or your strategy, the IP and IA issues are different, but I'd like to offer a few common threads here. The first is to review your intangible asset portfolio. We talked about the importance of a data strategy. Data is not intellectual property, in a way that you can't get a right to get a monopoly on it, but it is a really important intangible asset that you can put in place measures to both protect as well as to manage it. So, you know, set operational practices around how to collect it, what to protect, how to protect, how to make use of it. The second would be then to review also your IP portfolio, because you might not, you know, have a look and see what is working in the light of a rapidly changing context in your own industry? So industries are always getting disrupted with digitalization and what may be valuable today may not be valuable tomorrow. And I'll give an example, um, for example, in the automotive tech space, um, with the advent of electric vehicles and autonomous vehicles, you see incumbents like Daimler and General Motors and Honda jostling for innovation leadership with new competitors like LG, Baidu, Panasonic, Google, Huawei, and Intel. These are the companies that will enable smartness of the car. So whereas perhaps you had a great IP portfolio as an incumbent, look for those, which are cre those who are not in your space, your normal competitors. And on the back of that, the third option would be to explore partnerships because moving forward with digitalization, next slide please, it's really unlikely that a company will own all the IP that it needs. So to create value, sometimes you need collaborations so that parties can gain access to one another's IP as well as IA. So speaking of parties, you have a collaboration between Zook, which everyone of my generation knows, Razor and Vigo Live, together they can do club clubbing, and uh, sorry, cloud clubbing, and they can make that a reality. Each one individually probably couldn't do it, but together they could. So what can Singapore companies do? Um, and that's really why we are here as IFOS International is to support companies, drive digital, possibil digital possibilities and still manage their intangible assets well. So the first is, I think several speakers have already talked about upskilling build awareness and upskill your team. We really invite everyone to learn how to recognize and manage their intangible assets. And IPOS provides this um, in applied scenarios as well, because we often find that intellectual property and intangible assets, it's not just a technology issue, as some of our previous speakers have said, it's also about your finance, HR, procurement, and senior leadership across the board the senior leadership really has to be on board and has to understand what you're talking about. Second, take stock and review the business, right? Um, see intellectual property and intangible assets as strategic business assets, 
but then they're scattered through the whole company. For example, your technology might be on the R&D department. Then your trademarks and your patents might be at your legal department or your trademarks and brands might be in marketing. Your contracts to make sure that you're not infringing on anybody's IP might be held by procurement, but then how you're managing trade secrets um, might, and your confidential information might be managed by HR because they're managing people. And then your data and your software might be within IT. So bring them all together and you know, um, understand what you have and align it with the business objectives like Manjot has said. Then we can also, then we can mitigate the risk you know, manage the downside and then invest in the gaps to be able to get on, you know, to be able to uh, tap on the upside. And I guess the last point is to tap on government support as well. Uh, Ms. Jane Lim at the beginning of this conversation referred to the Productivity Solutions Grants and a range of other grants available by IMDA. But if you are developing technology that can be protected, especially things like patents for technologies or designs for your user interfaces um, because you're designing an app or something. Um, then tap on Singapore's tax deductions for companies who are uh, um, investing in IP, uh, IP, IP filings. So uh, you can get a 200% tax deduction. Um, and this also covers the expenditure if you need to in-license technology because you don't have it, but you need it to be able to move forward. Um, I guess in closing, uh, I just wanted to share the IP industry ourselves are not immune to the impetus to digitalize. So for example, IPOS last year launched IPOS Go. It's a mobile app for um, trademark applications. Uh, we're part of the Ministry of Law and you know, lawyers are well known for reams and reams of paper. But if we figured if you can get a mobile phone uh, account, you know, just through a couple of clicks on an app, or you can get a loan, or you can open a bank account, why shouldn't you be able to file your trademark? So you can literally file your trademark in under a minute. Um, you can uh, search your, uh, I, you know, search other trademarks that are have, that are already in play. You can renew your IPs all through an app. So we're trying as well to work on this journey so we can hopefully practice a little bit of what, we, what, we're, what we're preaching. Um, I guess it leaves it to me to just share that besides what tools I've talked about, we do offer a wealth of resources on our IPOS International website and our newsletters. So please connect with us, send us an email. We'd love to hear from you. Um, and you know, we hope that we can be of service to you. Thank you so much for coming. Really appreciate it. Yeah, um, I'm very excited to see there are a lot of questions coming in. Uh, so do stand by for them. Um, you know, like for example, um, who takes the uh, jurisdiction when, like, say, is uh, Alibaba uh, entering the, the party, and how about open source codes and all? Um, okay, just to make sure we have enough time. I'm sorry to have to rush you, Kevin. Um, so last but not least, you know, maybe the elevator pitch, you know, uh, Kevin, you know, the startup experience streams and um, your perspective on, you know, uh, leveraging opportunities. Uh, if you can invite you, please, Kevin. Yeah, hey, happy to be here. And, you know, like um, really um, cool to hear all the different um, digitization, digitalization um, initiatives um, that were shared by the esteemed panelists. So, I mean, um, my name is Kevin. So I'm a uh, founder of a single startup company. Um, so that was back in 2019. So I'll be going to be sharing with um, the audience and also um, the fellow panelists a little bit more of uh, practical applications um, that we had done um, specifically in the trade and transportation uh, ecosystem over here in Singapore. Um, so yeah, quickly um, at Tramas, we are looking to you know usher in a new age of collaboration across global supply chains, and you know um, we have um, existing uh, workflows or digital uh, in, uh, integrated workflows across multinationals, SMEs, um, and we're really excited to share with uh, everyone here gathered today. Right. So let's um, next slide, please. <clears throat> So let's look at the current state of affairs, right? So the cross-border uh, transportation industry is plagued with highly manual processes, paper-based processes, and operates across, you know, fragmented working groups, upstream and downstream, or import and export, which has led to high, you know, operating costs and opacity of information. So with ship shipping administrative costs attributing up to about 20% of our global freight costs for enterprises. So this entire global ecosystem, right, runs across, you know, 8,000 international ports, moving around 800 million, you know, TEUs of 20-foot containers internationally every year. 
and it's a, a, a pretty high growth uh, market with expected to go about 45% annually. So this entire um, system is, you know, uh, run by a myriad of organizations, you know, spanning small local businesses running college uh, and customs in every country to, you know, large global freight players of varying sizes, enterprises, governments, and more. Right. So um, next slide, please. So um, Charmes had been incorporated in Singapore. Um, so back in 2019 to serve the need, you know, for an integrated platform to bring about all these different players together, tackling the above uh, industry challenges. So, you know, in Singapore, we're ranked as the second busiest port in the world. And being here has given us the opportunity to, you know, put the product in front of numerous enterprises, both large and small. Um, next slide, please. Um, so we are part of the uh, uh, fast-growing uh, transport management system sector and are looking to deploy our technology across um, trade ecosystems from Singapore to place our product as the preferred collaboration tool for trade and transportation operations. So over the next couple of periods, we intend to bring value to our clients, you know, spanning uh, multinationals and SMEs operating in the ASEAN region, as we feel that there is a requirement, you know, for products like ours to, um, you know, help the, the, the region as it undergoes rapid digital transformation. So um, next slide, please. So I'm gonna quickly bring uh, us through um, some key features in the platform and we will um, be able to view that uh, uh, later. So first we you know pull and aggregate data from our users, um, multinationals and SMEs, um, their interactions on our platform and also uh, global data sources to provide you know, concise um, shipping milestones and collaboration. Um, second, we have a secure digital document sharing module, you know, providing access to all the different uh, stakeholders in the shipment, yielding greater collaboration and security via a permission-based blockchain platform, right? Um, third, we, are, we have integrated, you know, um, trade and transportation workflows across um, users from all our different organizations to simplify the process by enabling users to adopt, you know, an agile and data-driven uh, decision-making process. Um, lastly, we also provide, you know, um, um, next generation, like uh, customized collaboration tools to notify, you know, global users to resolve any issues that might impact their shipments. So our value proposition is underpinned by, you know, three uh, core principles. So as an enterprise-centric platform, you know, we customize workflows and services for large uh, multinational shippers. And as paymasters of their trade and transportation network, you know, this helps anchor um, their key logistic partners to provide, you know, a sim seamless uh, digital experience, enabling door-to-door -door visibility and orchestration, right? Um, we also act as a middleware amongst all stakeholders to provide, you know, a neutral vendor agnostic platform. So we overlay, you know, um, smart technology um, across multinationals and SMEs to work with um, their existing partners and also third-party data providers and avoid any um, concentration or preference to uh, specific uh, carriers and logistic players. So let's uh, look at some key features of the platform, All right? So next slide. So uh, we, 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 um, we leverage multiple data sources, um, such as, uh, next slide, please. Yeah, so um, we leverage multiple data sources like uh, global satellite and AIS data providers to provide real-time location of vessels, right? And we utilize these data to provide accurate predictions on arrival and departure times for all ocean vessels. Um, next slide, please. Um, so uh, our simple, you know, UI, uh, next slide please, yeah. Uh, our simple UI enables all users from uh, various organizations to get a holistic view on shipments managed by them and can view partners, invoices, and even if any of the goods being shipped need additional documentation, you know, to leverage uh, FTA agreements or free trade agreements or file declaration at import or export customs. Um, next slide please. Um, so we provide customized updates across um, the entire shipment journey and is collated and the various data sources can be viewed by all um, our users, right? So multiple data sources are leveraged and this allow our users, you know, to improve efficiencies when they run audits on freight invoices, for example. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so um, we also provide a, a summary view of the shipment where, you know, different uh, and important information can be viewed at a glance, you know, by all users or organizations. For example, booking information, documentation that's required, and also the various shipping containers that are, you know, involved in a particular shipment. Um, so here's our document um, sharing capabilities where all users um, that are involved in the shipment can upload, access, you know, view important information, and you know, all these access rights can be configured and gives a good audit trail of document versions and enforces, you know, timely um, filing of trade paperwork. <coughs> um, next slide, please. Um, so we also um, uh, provide, uh, next slide, please. Yeah, so we also provide um, customized uh, business analytics uh, dashboard for both operational and management users. So this gives uh, performance benchmarks and KPI tracking 
and also uh, our business insight team has been working with additional data points that enterprises want, you know, to augment the analyzed data set. Um, so I think uh, uh, we, we, we did uh, cover the importance of organizational data. Um, so we have seen usage in this for partner benchmarking, you know, FDA filing, track, trackability, and also sustainability matrices. Um, next slide, please. <clears throat> Yeah, so uh, we recognize that, you know, every trade and transportation operation is unique, you know, to scale efficiently, we provide tailored solutions to account for the diverse uh, groups of users across, you know, um, MNCs and SMEs. We have like a high touch configurable product for the large multinationals and are going to be launching a uh, low touch, um, you know, or, or MNC, uh, SME friendly um, product uh, Q1 next year. So in the interest of time, we're going to jump through a couple of slides so we can get some questions. In, uh, next slide, please. Um, so we have a pretty flexible um, pricing model. Um, next slide, please. Um, yeah, so pretty flexible pricing models. Um, so um, we have waterfall on um, tier pricing for large users and feature-based pricing for, um, say, uh, SMEs or lower lower tier users. Um, next slide, please. Um, yeah, so okay, so this is, uh, the, this is the quick snapshot of the current landscape. You know, we um, provide uh, a lot of uh, additional features. Um, for example, blockchain um, enabled um, document sharing, um, which we are working together with uh, IMD on trade trust, um, you know, uh, FTA recommender, uh, recommender, and you know, a full end-to-end -end, uh, 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 transportation scope, which is unique to us. Um, next slide, please. So, um, so I'm, I'm going to end on this slide uh, in the interest of time. So just a quick uh, snapshot. So we have gathered traction in Singapore with a global multinational. So they ship about 80,000 um, TEUs annually. And through the project, you know, we found that, you know, that having this integrated workflow has improved not just their productivity, but also the productivity of their partners by about 30%. You know, with 100% of the shipments are managed by our platform, giving updated uh, shipping milestones, running digitally with no manual paperwork. And, you know, having these different transportation stakeholders across a myriad of companies um, in the region and globally run international fleet, um, custom clearance, local haulage, all collaborate um, efficiently. So the previous videos were taken from our project with them. Um, we have launched our product in about 50 strategic lanes um, so out of Singapore and are going to about 200 strategic lanes uh, across the ASEAN region in the next couple of weeks. And the system is uh, deployed for this one company already sees, you know, users spending um, multiple uh, companies, right, from transportation to uh, logistic companies of varying sizes. So we're kicking off another initiative with a large uh, Japanese co uh, conglomerate in the co coming months and look to bring our solutions to, you know, SME markets um, in, over here in Singapore as well. So um, I think um, these are some of our uh, key focus in the next couple of months. Um, we can end here. Uh, I think, I think uh, we can also deal with uh, some of the questions, Shamir, I think in the interest of time and, uh, and, and, and ending the, the panel session uh, in a timely manner. Mm. Yeah. I know. Thanks so much, Kevin. Really appreciate yeah, no it. Worry. All right. All right. Cool. So, um, hey, we have about five minutes, I'm told, and uh, we do have a bunch of questions. And if I can kind of uh, synthesize them, there is a set of questions really directed at uh, Dr. Ming Tan and a set to Dr. Ni uh, sorry, Nicholas. So, so again, the theme and the key takeaway message of today is digitalize now, right? And I think Nicholas, uh, you have a lot of questions and uh, inquiries about the staff, huh? uh, would you like to uh, quickly address them for our attendees? Okay, thanks, Shamir. I think, uh, so just to have an overview of Star Fund, the Star Fund is actually to help uh, IT, uh, IT companies, right, that couldn't qualify for other government grants because of whatever reasons. Uh, and it is to help them uh, offset their costs to their clients itself. So for example, if I, I mean, the examples are on the website. So let's say for a client who has an IT vendor, who is a member of Agitech. The IT vendor can, doesn't qualify for the grant, so he goes to the Star Fund, applies and gets the grant so that he can offset this cost to the SME client itself. And this is really to help uh, digitalization, to help uh, people on, on board more digital tools. And we understand the challenging climate so that, um, it, so that nobody is left behind, right? Even though you don't cover, this uh, provides that uh, umbrella for those who are left behind. Uh, that's one. And number two, I think we have a lot of questions also on the uh, quantum of funding. I think we are still working those out. Uh, and uh, since the grant will be available for application on the 1st of October, uh, this, just look at our website. I think within the next one to two weeks, a more comprehensive set of FAQs will be published. Yeah, so please look out for that. Thanks. Oh, nice. Thanks so much. So this was an early preview. So you, you guys heard it here first. In, uh... <laughs> 
Good stuff, good stuff. Okay, uh, okay. There's a set of questions for Dr. Mingtan um, about you know cases of IP infringement and you know about jurisdiction and also about um, you know when a company uses open source DBs or source codes or, or even in um, what do you call it? Uh, I think there was a question about if a company doesn't overtly explicitly say that there's a PDPA thing, you know what happens if you could address this. Okay, um, maybe I do the source codes first and then the, some of the queries about infringements. Um, mm. I think that open source is a really valuable uh, tool but we have to, or really valuable platform, but we have to be able to know how to incorporate it into our businesses correctly. You know, it's, it's really a misnomer that once you incorporate open source into your products or once you open source your own code, then you have surrendered all control over everything um, or that you leave yourselves completely vulnerable to litigation forever and ever. Just be aware of what the um, terms and conditions of using source code are. So for example, if you use some source code, they say you then have to make it very obvious or that you have to publish whatever else you do. Be ready to abide by the terms of conditions when you're using source code but at the same time, um, you can uh, update your own code and identify which parts of the software is open source. And this is really something that you're putting back into the development community or to encourage development for your own platform as well, right? I mean, um, something like all of the Apple apps would not have got the kind of adoption had mm -hmm. nothing been opened at well. But once we know these are the bits which are really unique to my business and provide competitive advantage for me, once you are able to segregate, then you, can, you know what to protect and what to open so that you can build that community around you or you can drive adoption. Um, the other question for infringement, which is a, bit lit, a little bit different, which is um, uh, what are the options available if there are an infringement? It really depends on the type of the IP on the IA. You really got to make sure that you yourself have the right protection um, and you know, you've actually managed it well yourself because you don't want to have an infringement issue and then you have it blow back on you. And we've seen this in some cases where one company gets sued for being you know, uh, infringing and then the original company that brought the, brought the action was then... Uh, was then um, demonstrated to be infringing on other people's IP. But at the end of the day, litigation, which is the question in the, um, in the question and answer chat board, is really a last resort. There are loads of schemes, there's mediation, there's arbitration, and then um, there's uh, litigation which goes up to the high court. But um, there is a whole range. I'm happy to say that uh, IPOS has a scheme to choose mediation because it's much faster. Um, and is much more cordial and amicable. Um, and also the mediations and hearings are digital and you can do that virtually mm -hmm. as well. Thanks so much. Uh, so I hope that addresses our attendees' questions. Um, I know Mr. Manjot has to run, uh, but maybe final closing notes, you know, from the M1 perspective to inspire our attendees to digitalize now. I can invite you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you. I'll try my best. Um, no, I think um, um, I think all panelists have um, have shared that thought um, that it's an inevitability. Uh, it's not something that you can uh, you can. Uh, it's it's. I read a quote which said, "It's not the right thing to do. It's the only thing to do." <laughs> um, so um, so I think as uh, as economies develop and as consumer behavior behaviors change. Uh, accelerated by now what we've seen in the pandemic, I think clearly um, we have no choice. Uh, and I think um, the challenge obviously remains is uh, how do you do it? Uh, to what extent do you do it? And how much patience and commitment do you have to go through it? Uh, I think those are the critical questions that one needs to answer. Uh, and of course, having the end game in sight is very, very important to my mind. Because as an organization which has been a legacy organization for the last 25 years, we've been a successful telecom company. Um, but to go through transformation, it brings a lot of change. Uh, and if you don't have uh, the end goal in sight, uh, it's very easy uh, to, uh, to be wayward and, and get lost in, in, the, in the woods, really. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think it's important for uh, identifying the goal and then going about it with a lot of patience and courage. 
um, because that's that's really needed uh, <laughs> as as it is as it is a long uh, as it is a long process. Indeed, indeed. Um, right. But I, I think, uh, like I said, it's the only thing to do. Uh, yeah. There is no other way out for organizations. Really. Completely agree. Completely agree. So. Uh, you know, so maybe to summarize quickly, in, um, so we learned a few new terms today, at least I did. So uh, to digitize doesn't mean to make into fingers. I mean, it's a hazard of being a molecular biologist to think digitize you, digital, you know. So digitize is to make it into bits and bytes and to digitalize is to actually, you know, embrace those processes. I hope I didn't butcher that up. Yeah. And we also learned about the uh, Star Fund that SG Tech is uh, launching in a few days time. And you know, M1's perspective, uh, adopting it, and also uh, Kevin's exciting launch soon. You know, so I hope it was a meaningful panel for everyone. And, um, you know, I'd like to express my appreciation again. Thank you to each of our panelists, you know, from uh, Nicholas, Manjo, Dr. Ming, Kevin. Thank you so much. So over you. to you again, Abraham. Appreciate it. Thanks, guys. Thank you very much. <laughs>